Hello everyone, again. <laughs> um, thank you for bearing with us throughout um, our kind of technical difficulties. I mean, it is also the first episode in this new series. Um, so there's always going to be some hiccups. Um, and I really appreciate your, um, yeah, sticking with us. And um, yeah, I'm very excited about this um, talk today. And you know, for those of you who haven't been to the, haven't seen what on the SETI kind of looks like, um, it's kind of coming into its 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 own shape this year, um, again, and always reinventing. So um, yeah, I will just start and kind of uh, get into um, what this series is about, what the front room is, what on the SETI is, and all of those things. Um, so for those of you who are kind of joining us for the first time, um, I not only want to welcome you to On The SETI, but also to The Front Room, um, which is the beginning of an ambitious long-term neighbourhood project. Um, and, you know, it's about a platform in Birmingham to be designed and co-owned by local communities. Um, so, you know, Hello again, welcome now that I've introduced what um, the front room is. Um, you know, On The SETI is a place of sanctuary, um, a place where you can take a load off. And on our SETI, you will discover conversations that will slot into your day, like a catch up with an old friend, or, um, you know, your favorite song, or just kind of listening to a podcast. But this space is meant to feel like home. Um, and it's a space where you can feel that kind of vulnerability um, while connecting with other people and yourselves. So, um, yes, thank you. Uh, so here's just a little bit about this series. Um, so we are focusing on storytelling. As most of us know, storytelling is a really powerful means of fostering connections among people between ideas and experiences. And when it comes to our kind of countries, our communities and our families, we understand that stories kind of hold this common place of um, importance and it kind of ties and binds us together. Um, and in this series, we, really wanted to connect with people who use the art of narrative throughout their work to connect, educate, share their experience of themselves um, and others. And I really wanted to kind of steer it away from um, this kind of monolithic um, view of, um, of celebration and pain and love, um, but to kind of show the varied aspects of things all kind of in between. And throughout this series, um, we do touch a lot on documentation as it plays a really important role in the process. Um, and this series of conversations kind of moves between still image, moving image, um, written word to kind of consider all those different aspects um, of storytelling and kind of what we use to do that. Um, so yeah. I'm your host, Danny Banks Group, also known as Zaz, also known as Zazu. And today I'll be speaking to Alison Baskerville. Um, so uh, it feels weird to be like Alison Baskerville. So <laughs> Ali B <laughs> um, is a documentary photographer um, uh -huh. and a personal safety trainer. Um, just to let everyone know, the Q&A is open for this talk. So as me and Ali are kind of reading the world to write, um, you can drop in your questions. Um, we would love to kind of just hear what you're taking from the talk. If you've got um, anything that you want either of us to kind of clarify or go back to, we will definitely do that. So um, yes, please feel free to just use that Q&A. Um, if you are watching via YouTube, uh, you can comment on the YouTube stream and those comments will come all the way to me. Um, now that we've got through our technical difficulty, those comments will come to me <laughs> and we will just kind of um, share that through. So however you're interacting with us, um, let's like yeah connect throughout this talk so firstly Alison Baskerville also known as Ali B to many 
Um, can you just give us a wave and tell us a little bit about what you do? I feel like I turned my um, camera off, like on too early. So I've just been sat here like... No, it's fine. I've been like enjoying seeing your face just there. Like, hello, <laughs> <laughs> we do this thing, remember? <laughs> like, here I am. Um, <laughs> What do I do? This is always a really, this is always a hard question, isn't it? When you do like lots of different stuff, like the I'm not, I, I, definitely, I definitely don't have the cliche um, Hollywood uh, elevator pitch of, hi, I'm Ali Baskerville. Um, so, um, <laughs> really? Uh, I'm looking forward to that. <laughs> um, yeah, my name's Ali. Um, um I'm uh I was a sort of like a press photographer stroke photojournalist um and then back in the in the early days of my life in my early 20s I was in the military for quite a long time I was in the RAF and then I went on to to go into the to the army as a photographer as a reservist and then did uh left and uh did an MA in photojournalism and then went down the path of moving more into nurturing my creative side that had been quite suppressed in my old job and um, went into photojournalism and then have now recently transitioned more towards documentary and uh, and more recently um, in the last couple of years I've been taking some of those experiences and blending them together to work as um work in the, in the theme of safety kind of a theme because of how we're approaching it and set up a I set up a thing <laughs> called raw I've got <laughs> a little a little movement shifting and shaking um doing some uh, some work around that so well, we I think that's kind of like raw we'll be getting into that I love that you like started to think uh, it's a little thing we'll we will be tapping into raw and um, <laughs> no one will leave this this conversation thinking it's just a thing just a little thing like no one will leave thinking that um but we will get there We'll get to that bit. Um, that was a really nice overview of like the things that you've done. You saying that's a hard question, but you were just like, okay, let's go. It's this thing, it's this thing. Um, but I think there's the thing about your kind of um, career and practice all kind of merged into one is that it kind of has touched a lot of different areas. Um, and we'll get into this a little bit more as well um, as the, the talk goes on. Um, there's something about how your career and your practice has kind of developed and changed in a way that is kind of um, acknowledging different areas and looking at where those spaces actually are not, um, yeah, are not the best <laughs> or are oppressive or are harmful. And then there's parts of your practice that kind of come back full circle almost to... Hello, Sorry, Jean. there's there's obviously someone else on the couch with me. <laughs> That's and okay. <laughs> come here. Come here. Um, and then there's this part of of what you do that almost comes back in and fills all those um spaces as well. Um, so I would like to start with my first kind of question. And to be fair, Tink might have some answers for this because I think she's ready to get involved. Um, my first question is. When we spoke recently, you used this phrase where you said you were like looking for the human story and not the new story. So I kind of want to unpack that a little bit. Um, so firstly, kind of what does does that mean? Because um, how I interpret some of it is that there's this link when when you're documenting something that is connected to journalism, that is connected to the news. There's a little bit of um, sometimes a, a disconnect or spaces where like maybe harm or um, not inclusive spaces are not created enough or shown enough. So I just wanted you to kind of, yeah, go into a little bit about that phrase um, and then yeah, kind of will pick up on a little bit of what comes out um, when you are not looking for the human story and when you are just looking for the new story. It's kind of weird, isn't it? Because like, what, what do we mean by the, the story? Hang on, let me just get a tink. Come here, come here. 
I was so I've, I've even spoken to my neighbour and her little kids and they're like don't worry I won't rattle that, that box because that's normally what they do about this time on a Saturday <laughs> and Junior's just been outside rattling my little box so uh, <laughs> he's five he's five <laughs> um that's her favourite thing to do on a Saturday apparently um yeah um I mean, all, all stories that have like a, a, a created by like humans, right? They're created by consciousness. Like we, that's the part of being human is like how we relate to our consciousness and the fact that we use stories to tell information about ourselves, about other people, about our existence. And so all stories are human, but to me, there always seem to be this kind of, um, this, in my own um way of approaching photography I always felt like I was clashing with something every time I was doing something that was potentially supposed to be newsworthy and Mm -hmm. I didn't I didn't know what that was because I don't think I really had reflected or unpicked the the reasons why photography was like broken down into lots of different genres and um, so when I did, I knew when I was working as a, as a photojournalist that there was something not quite right about what I felt was the stories I wanted to share and then who would actually share them. Mm. And I was like, on paper, really unsuccessful as a press photographer because um, when I was working for like a commission for a, for a news agency or a paper, I really struggled to get what they wanted to see. And I think there was some, like, there was this need for, like, to have, like, I remember this awful phrase, uh, it's got to be, this was from, like, a, a like a tabloid uh, photographer who said, like, it's got to be cute, sexy, or wow. And I was like, I don't, I don't know what that, like, I, do, I can't be a part of that. Um, what does that even mean? And what, yeah. and what does it mean if the story doesn't fit into those categories does that mean it's not valid story does that mean that experience isn't um isn't one to be talked about it's about selling pages right or um you know getting people to uh, click onto websites and it i mean this is a huge like subject really because um there is like there's always been a desire to see behind the kind of headline there's always been that name there's always been people who want to do that but it just yeah. doesn't sell so it's it's harder to find and uh, I remember when I started my um, MA there was this magazine called Photo 8 okay. um, and in there you'd get like proper photo stories right like they'd be they felt like they were developed they felt like they had a connection to the people in the stories they seemed to be like more compassionate and um, if you can see that in a photo, I, I'm not sure, but I think you can, when you know more about the photographer and you look more about their kind of like motivations, you can start to get a better sense of like how authentic the story might be. Mm. But in a news image, like that photo would be, you could send it to a picture desk and then anybody could license that image, right? And it could be used in any context. And because I was a, a pretty lousy press photographer, that rarely happened to me, right? Until I got like asked to do like royal rotor jobs and I think I did it because I wasn't so like I wasn't an aggressive or pushy photographer and I didn't want to get like to the front they picked me to do it because they were like Ali will just like shadow these royals take their pictures and then be gone because it didn't really mean like it wasn't a big deal and I took this picture of Kate Middleton once and I thought it was quite a nice portrait of her I filed it Next day, it was in the Daily Mail, zoomed in, saying she's got grey hair because, like, she's not dying her hair because she's pregnant. And then when that happened, I was like, no, I'm done. Like, I'm not finding any more pictures like this. And and I sort of, I, I think most of the time working in this environment, I've learned by experience, really. And, uh, but also by sometimes calling myself out. Mm. Um, on some of the stuff I've done and trying to blend like reflecting on my past career without um like living in shame for some of that stuff you know it's been it's been quite a tricky path but I think because of that it's made me want to change direction for the 
for, for what I feel is the better path, more probably a more moral path. I think I've got quite um, quite strong moral values that I follow, follow, which is not easy. I think it's harder to do that. I think society's set up to take sometimes wants to take the fastest, least complex path. Um, but and, and I'm I'm a slower thinker, so doing press photography was wild. Really, it was almost like I hadn't got over being in the military and being like sent on assignment. Off you go. And there's something there that you said about it's almost like this idea and need. And I've been thinking about this a lot recently, actually, especially when it comes to like reality TV or whatever. There's this idea that comes with it that if you do not think in this particular way do this particular thing it's like this business isn't for you and it almost says like you know that you've just got to lump it and if you want to be successful if you do not do these things you will just not make it because you are not like good enough that's the the then the 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 lasting thing right I'm not good enough to be in this thing even though actually what people often do is they go into whatever their practice is they take let's say images for example they take photographs and they are delivering part of the story that is kind of the most true to them or that feels in your case the most authentic story right so it's almost like you taking this photo of Kate Middleton and then it being like that story absolutely being ripped into something that you are definitely like not that person. That's not the story that you were trying to tell. Um, and when I was thinking about this talk today, a lot of what was kind of in the underbelly of that is when your work is or when you're working in a certain part of the industry that can take or that looks at your work as a product, that's that's the point I'm trying to make, when it's looked at as a product, um, there's often little conversation that photographers then get to have about their work unless it is really part of your personal practice. Um, And I felt like that was really something that was missing it felt like it was just missing there's like all these images I know we've spoken about how many images don't leave the hard drive or how many images like you know don't get into a certain piece because it maybe isn't you know aesthetically um what is needed or whatever or wanted it's just really interesting the places that we lose the story we we like continually Mm. losing the story because we're losing the context um And there's something about that that is almost, it's not just devaluing, but it is kind of like dehumanizing the ways that we produce and deliver at art, right? Whether you're doing that for monetary like gain or whatever, you know, we all have bills to pay and everything like that. But there's something that um, pulls the narrative and it just kind of, can go off and be its own thing um and there's something that we had kind of touched on um that I've kind of I think this is probably a, a good time to kind of pull it out but like what happens or what are the um kind of repercussions of of that happening when your work is taken out of context what can you is there even anything you can do or would want to do or is that just a, something that photographers have to kind of just take as well this is just what it can happen and that's just like a risk or you know well it depends on who you are as a person I mean and how what your values are I mean a lot of this is about your own values and and also about your commitment to say press photography and um there are some like really great photographers out there who do this work it's not like I'm not commenting on like individuals it's just more that the way the systems are like the better you get at something or if you don't have 
another income to support you, you're probably going to have to try and make money from your work. And so when we want to show more nuance and we want to like get into stories more and you get more into documentary work or fine art photography, that there's such a huge amount of privilege that comes with that. So it's, you know, so for some press photographers who are freelancers, that's like their only route of income. And they get to a point where I think they do sell their soul a bit because they know that they've got a good image. They know that someone's going to put it on a front page and then they probably are, are aware that it's going to go into like multiple different outlets and they're probably going to get paid. And if you work for a news world, like Associated Press or the Press Association, that's what they do. That's their business model mm. to get that picture as quickly as possible out into that like economy right of buying it and yeah so it goes right back to like you as a person knowing what you're getting into and like or maybe having an understanding of what it is you're about to enter as a as a career and um and I can't really speak for like other photographers uh, but what I did notice when I was doing press photography it was incredibly white cis male dominated and uh, there were very few women or queer people that I would be aware of or working at the time. And I'm talking like kind of 2011-ish, so not really that long ago. And there was something like quite uh, like dominant about the press photography world. And I'm always careful about like, when we talk about representation, I always think we have to like think about what are we representing like, why, why would you want to get into, like, this thing where it's just really damaging and harmful to people? And and I, th and, and I, I think about this quite a lot because I think most of the, the difficult work I've done as a photographer has been when I've tried to file things, to get things published, to, like, pay the cost of, like, where I've been to cover, like, mm -hmm. the flight or to cover my own bills and... I thought I have to try and find another way to support myself financially so I can get away from this. Yeah. And and not everyone will do that. I mean, so it's, it's, again, it's like, I know it's really, it's cliche to say it's really complex, but it is, and it really does, but it is depending on like someone's understanding of that, um, of why photography has gone down that road. And it's because like sometimes, I mean, photography press photography started because like the news was illustrated it was called the illustrated news mm. so major news stories were illustrated by somebody uh on for front pages to kind of put a visual aspect to the news and it's it's a very western centric way of doing things and you know so you have to like go back and look at the history of press photography and the history of photography will stop as a form of like documentation, anthropology, all those really damaging, like harmful ways of documenting other other human other human beings, right? Yeah. So, um, and I didn't have that awareness when I was doing it, and I was complicit in in doing that and in, in like replicating that. And um, I know I'm quite like strong about this, and a lot of people probably aren't as as concerned, but it's put me in a in a part point of time now where I would not accept like any assignments that I didn't feel that I could credibly represent anymore yeah um and that's been really important because I've always come back from places that I might have been commissioned to go to and just felt a bit sort of sick a bit like you know I've just got on the plane and I've just left all that suffering behind and you know and and, and it's sort of what does it really mean to like document this? What is it, what is it doing? And it's really egotistical to think that you can um, document suffering and it will change something. It's, it's really almost ineffective really. Mm -hmm. If you, if for you, it might be collectively helpful for people to have a better understanding of, of a story, Yeah. but you'll never like, you know, it, it's, it's almost kind of wild that people will think my, photos will make this difference and then they enter them in a competition and people win awards for it and then it goes along this other like right. <laughs> very very <laughs> challenging cycle and uh, yeah and it, it, it's a constant you're constantly thinking about what what it is you're doing because you know a camera by its very nature is exploitative mm -hmm. it's 
it is it is taking something it is yeah. you're taking a photo an image of someone so for me it's it's really about relationship building now and getting a better sense of like people if you're sharing their story if you're if you're doing something conceptual where mm. it's something created between you where it's just like more artistic and like maybe it's like uh like you know this is why I like watching music videos because it's like you know everyone's involved in it there's more yeah. consent in lots of ways but when you're doing uh, stories and photo stories these are real lives you know these are people's re real lived experience so mm. I always tried my hardest in the time that I was given to try and reflect some of that in the work instead of just getting the images that were needed for the story so I probably wasn't like a journalist's top pick a photographer because yeah. oh you know I would I would push back on stuff and I remember in the Philippines that I got really cross with the journalist and said I just wasn't going to take this photo of him handing out tents to people I was like you're, you're not <laughs> this is not this is not right. good journalism so this um, is um a a project that we're going to speak about more today um in the Philippines but there's something that you said it's almost like I guess and like, obviously correct me if I'm wrong, this is just kind of the, the feelings that I get around it is there's part of, I guess, going into a place for like whatever reason, whether there's been a disaster, whether there's been, it's often if there's something bad that's happened, right? But let's say like also, you know, whatever's happening, an event. So there's like almost these, this two part of like the, the partnership of like a photographer and a journalist and how those kind of roles overlap um and something you said really stuck out to me a couple of days ago and you said it's like there's like journalists are meant to kind of be more on that like neutral aspect of reporting so what I've kind of found is, and also just like in the society that we live in, right? We're a very labeled society and we very much kind of want or need stories to be in a certain way for us to deal, to cope, to yeah. like love, find joy, all of that. And there's something about that example of you saying I'm not taking this photograph of you handing out these tents because there's that narrative there is isn't the narrative of the people that are that were there in the Philippines right that that is an example of a narrative being built for an image yeah and I think with that comes this um this real danger and harm of creating stories right and I guess what can can happen is when that is wh when that creation of this narrative is happening you are actively silencing the people that are experiencing whatever that event is and that is often where I feel that harm then creeps in because yeah you're basically using people or their experience as like a backdrop for what you want the public to see. And I think journalism and photography kind of like matched together in that way. There's something about, um, about the morals, like you mentioned, and that is like a place where you will really like see who, like, yeah, what the, the morals are in, in that way. And, it's really difficult it's difficult when you see kind of let's say documentations of Africa and and you know there's like naked kids everywhere or people are starving or you know whatever there's this like that narrative is it has been kind of like deliberately pushed right it's like this is just the view of Africa and it's not actually um, 
often that's the image that people have because that narrative is so you know we've grown up seeing it on advertising for like ever it's it's Mm. such a thing Mm. um and it's so dangerous it's so dangerous because I feel like if you show someone um yeah like an image of a city with lights and it's bustling and people are moving around and you say this is Lagos and people are like what there's almost this like yeah did this moment of um of othering and when you other you start to take away people's humanity in lots of ways um and there's just something really like interesting about that and what that looks like um and how that really influences your thinking for like years to come (laughs) there's not it's not just like it's just that one moment um so I'm really I'm really glad that you kind of touched on even that experience of um, of actually being like, no, I'm not taking this photo because it's like, you know, morally, what are we trying to do? Like, what are we doing? What are we trying to say? Yeah. Um, and it's almost like the privilege that comes with it, right? This like hero kind of complex sometimes um, and like the ego that kind of builds in. So yeah, it's just really interesting what people want and see as as being neutral, right? And and how that can shift and what that means when it does. Um, yeah, all food for thought. My mind is just like going. Um, and a lot of journalists would have never asked to do that. Mm. Right? You know, they're, they're, you know, this this is not like a uh, it, uh, is it good or bad, right? It's not. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's straightforward. And like, there's Instagram. Uh, there's an Instagram channel called Everyday Africa that my friend runs, who's a um, an African photographer based in Nairobi called Sarah Wiseworth. Mm-hmm. And she set it up like a few years ago, and it's got like a huge following. And these these are all photographers based across the continent of Africa, mm-hmm. in in their cities. And like they and and be, and they set it up because they were really tired of that thing you just talked about about misrepresentation and mm-hmm. it, it's kind of also sad that they have to like do that you know but but they but because they've done it they now get hired to do those stories there right so it's like it's hugely important for people to like represent themselves first and foremost and like when I went to the Philippines did I find any Filipino photographers to work with no did I see if there was anyone who could do that job no do I do that now yes <laughs> you yeah. know and and to the point where people don't ask me to go now because they know that I will signpost them to uh yeah. more credible photographers so yeah um and that's that I think that's part of the work I think it's a part of the work we all have to do to like see where what gaze we are using on these stories and Absolutely. what questions Absolutely. are we asking ourselves and also the reasons that we're there and I'm not going to invalidate my past and the stories that I can share but um I will question them occasionally I will like reflect back on those images and and think "Mm, I probably wouldn't do that like that again Mm -hmm. um you know what's what are some of the lessons that I've personally learned and what are useful to share because what also is important is not to be like morally superior because you came to that like people come to things at different times in their lives and it's not it's not down to one of any one of us to say to start going into that kind of like well I'm morally pure and I'm going to shame you because that's part of the problem as well so yeah. I think most of this is about operating from a place of compassion and compassion is easy with people you like yeah. you have the same values as you yeah compassion with people who have very different views from you and to see their humanity is the really hard journey and the one that for me is worth taking so mm-hmm. um I think photography is has been a good start for me to do that but I don't you know I also like think it was, it, it's moved away from that because um I've had to go back to to work out what am I what do I feel like the most credible and authentic to like photograph and document and be in and it's a journey isn't it it's like it's yeah that it's there's a nuance with everything and almost like, yeah, not always just bringing in cancel culture as the only viable, like, lesson, right? Um, because we all reach different 
places and it's really necessary for us to have that journey and it just may not look like everyone else's right but you almost need to like how it's you know it's the making mistakes the learning from that the growing and that's really the important um kind of journey to to go through and I do think there's lots of kind of um different ways that people do that right and I think if it gets to the point where you're then rethinking how you do things because of like you know your past or whatever it's really important to kind of remember to hold that for the next person right and remember to kind of like allow them that kind of space um so we kind of mentioned Philippines a few times um and I'd really love to uh share some of the images that you sent me um while I kind of set that up if you could just give us a little bit of a yeah a a little bit of context around um what the images um I'm about to show kind of are from what happened where was this um yeah you I'll pass that over to you and I will get these images ready yeah thank you um so there was a um a big typhoon hurricane in um the Philippines in 2013 I think it was around about October um and I got asked by uh don't judge me, the Sunday Mirror, <laughs> to um, to go uh, and cover it. And I've been asked to do it because I have um, a military background and they wanted somebody who was quite good at dealing with like stuff like that. You know, it's quite a, um, and you know, a lot of, and I say, I say they wanted someone who had an understanding of like safety. That isn't the case for lots of photographers and they would mm-hmm. often go into very risky environments without any, um, any sort of preparation or any chance to do any kind of like safety training yeah um, so um, it was like I rarely did assignments of this nature as in uh, emergencies um, I'd never covered a natural disaster before so um, I was obviously a bit nervous about it um, and I'd I think I'd I'd just come back from uh, Afghanistan um doing an assignment there and I I was kind of in a bit of a pattern as in um I was just going from one difficult assignment to another and in at at the time my brain saw this as less dangerous as going where I'd just been so I didn't really it didn't feel whilst I was a little bit nervous I felt like I was just in a kind of a a kind of (laughs) like a hamster wheel of like, okay, I've, I've, I've not really unpacked from this assignment. So I'm just going to change the, look at like biohazards and make sure I've got like PPE and uh, look at what the risks is from going to a place where they've experienced a hurricane, a lot of reading in. And then, um, then I flew into Manila and um, went to another island. So if you know about the Philippines, there's like 26 different islands that make up the Philippines, Manila being the capital. Um, and as I, as I was there, I learned that like it used to be a place where the Americans would uh, uh, stick their ships during the Second World War. And they'd also contributed to a lot of problems there with young Filipino women. Um, just, you know, I started to like unpick again the kind of Western influence and <laughs> uh, damage caused to yet another part of the globe. Um, and. I stayed in this place called Cebu, which was where the main airport was that was taking the aid um, into Tacloban. And Tacloban was this uh, other city on another island that had been the most affected by this hurricane. And um, I got there about 10 days after after the first after, after the hurricane hit. There's a few um, few a few small ones after that, but the main one I'd got in about 10 days after. And um, I didn't really know how to um, cover this because it was, there was still a lot of, um, and sorry, trigger warning, I might say things that might be a bit difficult. Um, there were still uh, bodies in, in, you know, sort of in, in the streets um, and in body bags and sometimes not. Um, and when we got into, when we flew in, there was just all this uh, like twisted metal, this, this wind I'd never seen 
anything caused so much destruction and just bend metals and uh, knocked like these statues over, some of which was a good thing actually. Um, and they're all twisted around and, and people's homes are just being blown away. Um, and also these huge container ships have been like lifted on this tidal wave and sort of moved into the mainland, into the, into the islands and sort of grounded themselves on top of people's houses. And um, I can't remember the final statistic, like the number of people that died, but it was it was in the thousands. And I, I sort of stayed in a in an NGO's place, and we brought our own food and and supplies in because we were aware that obviously, you know, the the, the aid that was coming in was not for like the media <laughs> or or aid workers. It was there for the people that were sort of living there. So we took enough stuff in for like a few days. Um, and I, I sort of covered like the camps that were being set up and the food distribution. And then I just started walking around really and started mm. meeting people and sort of, um, and I don't know what like order you've got the pictures in Danny. So, um, yes. Okay. <laughs> so, um, I think I'll, what I'll do is I'll kind of scroll through a little bit so you can see the order, but I'll pick up on why I put them in that order first. Yeah, week. yeah. Um, cool. And um, let's kind of go through it that way. Um, so this is was the image that I put as the first one because obviously it kind of shows this real, you know, um, whirlwind that has literally happened. Um, but what I found really interesting was just this like, welcome to sign and it's yeah. like there's almost this irony that comes with it because it's just like this sign literally withheld so much um and I just wanted to start with this image because there's something about the way that it almost like sets the the tone and I think it also sets the tone of it's almost like the human story meets the new story in a way. There's just mm. something that feels very um, informative about it. You can see it and you can say, right, you can tell there's been a natural disaster here. But the way that it's kind of like even just framed, there's something that just allows you to really think for yourself about what that kind of devastation feels and looks like and even they're just being like mm. one person just in this image just like probably doing just something you know they were just drying everything just trying right. to dry stuff <laughs> and there's something about that so that was the reason why I kind of started um this one it's the first one um and this image really just kind of made me go like and and it's something to do with the lighting and the framing the way mm. that like there's kind of like this light just pouring in almost like on these like empty seats and it really made me think about how many people are lost within these kind of natural disasters how many um you know people just don't or, or, or and maybe don't necessarily die but are lost because they have lost so much but then there's just something else really beautiful. The fact that there's just like these groups of people, right? So you've kind of got this absence of people, but then it's kind of makes me think so much about community and about how people almost like continue in a way that you just like need to survive, I guess. Um, and then we to talk about why they're all together. Yes. That would be really good because the next image kind of goes on to that. So yeah, you talk about that and um, because it's it, it's so it's 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 uh, kind of cool. Like it's not cool, but it's just kind. Of, is it cool? What is it? This this is like a huge stadium, and uh, a lot of people got into this stadium during the main flood waters because it offered them like a bit of protection, and it got totally flooded out. And unfortunately, a few people lost their lives inside this stadium. And by the time we got there, it completely like uh, dry, not dried out, but it emptied out. And um, the Manny Pacoya is a really famous boxer uh, from the Philippines. 
and he was having a title fight. And so some aid organisations managed to find some TVs and managed to set them up inside this stadium. And um, it was probably the first time that Taklaban City had gathered um, because they like absolutely love Manny and also he represents them, um, you know, as a, a, a kind of world title weight boxer. So, um, so we, we, we heard about it and we went down to the stadium and there was like this just one like TV and uh, sorry, there was two, those were like facing either side and uh, all these people came into the stadium. And I think what was really uh, so um, powerful is that <laughs> there was like this collective emotion that perhaps they hadn't had a chance to share. At this point, they were still trying to find their possessions. They were, some of them were living in the Catholic church. Um, there is a big Catholic church in Tacloban, and so a lot of people had sought refuge in there. Some people were still picking through that what's left of their houses. Some people were in the hospital, but the word got out that they were putting this Manny Pacoy fight on, and you just started seeing people like coming from everywhere to get into this stadium. And whilst we were in there, I just noticed people were starting to fall asleep really quickly. It's like they just had this moment where they could just have a bit of a break from all the sort of stress that they must have been going through and all this kind of um trying to put their lives back together um and there was cheering and there was joy and there was clapping and uh and nobody used these pictures like they weren't seen as uh, as newsworthy and uh and i think what i've enjoyed always photographing have, have been the things that are not considered that but have been like real moments for people and um, I've always struggled with like photographing people without being able to ask them beforehand. So sometimes I do really big crowd shots where you can't really see anybody that well. Um, but and then times like this where I've like shared it because like I never sent these pictures out because I was like I haven't like asked everybody here if I can show their photo and I still feel uncomfortable about it now. But there's something about the way people are sitting on the front row. Some people are like really relaxed. Some people got their feet crossed. Some people are like the guy in the red shirts, like sat on the edge with his feet through. And like you can sort of like scan that image and just like it's really, really relatable. It um, is. And it's also just like this position of like this TV. So you said there were like multiple <laughs> kind of TVs like going, you know, different ways people can see. But there's something about this like collectiveness and for me I find it really interesting when I see kind of like images of like things on mass so like people or loads of people or loads of like objects or whatever there's something like read that really draws me in and this feels like this story of like of the the it's just kind of like the human nature right like you hear that there's that, like there's like TVs that are going to be there, like you know the stadium, almost having this layered feeling of you know people losing their lives in there, but then almost that it still becomes a place of refuge, but then it also becomes a place of like sharing because everyone there is going through such similar things but it's mm. almost like a space where people are allowed to 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 show like joy and like laughter and like you said have this kind of like respite right of just like we're here and we're doing this thing um and there's something really powerful about that and it, the image has really like struck like me especially with like all the like bright colors as well it's not these are not the images that we usually see around natural disasters or around, you know, things that are, are really devastating. And there's something that kind of brings it back to that place of like humanity. Um, and it's just really, yeah. yeah, it's really, really striking. And like, thank you for just like sharing that like story around this fight. Cause it's just kind of like, you can, you can so imagine it, right. It's like, it almost reminds me of like, I don't know, a football match or something's happening and like everyone's like gone to like one family member's house and everyone's kind of like crowding around and watching it. Um, and there's something really important about that. And it's 
this relatable um, idea of and feeling of collectiveness. Um, so thank you for just kind of giving us a little bit more insight into that. Um, so next image. Um, this was the, so I've decided to put this one here because it's almost like the zoom out. You're seeing mm -hmm. people within this space and then you're seeing people, we're not really seeing many people. There's like a one person that you can directly see like, or like two people kind of clearly anyway. Um, and again, this thing of like color just like pops out to me, but also like this rubbish or being like collected in like a one space. And it's almost the opposite of what what's happened here, right? There's actually this collective of putting together something that is like neatly compiled almost. Um, and I don't really know what else I really have to say about this, but there's just something that made me really think about the way that like the, the ground is, like the ground has obviously been through like so much, like, you know, um, like trauma. Um, and what that means when this is happening to the land that we live on. Um, and when we're taking like buildings out of the equation and you're almost re rebuilding your life in a way that is, um, is temporary, but isn't temporary in lots mm. of ways because that's where you've grown up or that's where you lived and that's where your family are. Um, so yeah, it would be nice to just have a little bit of kind of context about about this image and why it was, you felt that this was something to to be documented in this way? Um, well, I mean, this photo was about, it is like for me at its heart was about resilience of community because <laughs> the, the speed at which these tents went up and the way that people made their living spaces in it and the way they supported each other was something that I hadn't seen before. And I am always like um, interested in how people connect over community, what community actually means, especially in the face of a, of a disaster after such huge loss and how that there was something about the families that I met in Tacloban where you could see that this existed before this natural disaster that this was like amplified because of this natural disaster, not because the of it, not because of it. And it was a it was a really strong message to me about how flawed Western culture is and how our societies are around community, because we we haven't developed this because we've been the oppressors and not the oppressed. And I know that's a strong statement, but I think it has, we have something about our individuality in Western cultures that means we're incapable sometimes of even being like this. I, I think about COVID all the time when I look at images like this because we're out there doing like quite self-centered things to try and cope. And yet I, I can look back at my hard drive and be reminded frequently of like human resilience at its best. And I, it's sad that it gets to this point to show it mm. that people have to suffer in this way but the the way that and, and also I had this little bit of me that's got that military thing about organized you know getting tents up and I was like wow these are like these these folks are like on this like they're getting these tents up they're organizing people's rations they're getting everybody into like a, a place to get sanitized water you know they got all the buckets sorted out so that they could get their rations every day they were sorting each other's laundry out they were going for each other's stuff they were organizing this pile of things that were totally broken so they could just get rid of them um and they just and so I, I didn't know how to do that you know I saw it close up and then I thought no I need to like and I was stood on the edge of the stadium watching the boxing and went outside and thought wow <laughs> yeah you know this the, and and that's what that's what that personally this image personally meant to me and I think what's interesting is to when you put images out, people will have their own like connections to it. It will connect to them in different ways. It will mean something different to them. And I think that's really important to try not to tell people what this is like to them. This is still open to like 
anybody's view or and, and relationship to this. And if I was to go back to Tacloban and show this picture, it will mean something different, you know, to to the people that were in those tents. Um, and there's something about humour, like they called this the holiday resort. Like they had like Welcome to Tacloban Holiday Resort, and they had like I think they called it. Um, they had different signs that they'd made right <laughs> around like they called it a beach resort and um you know this thing about humor in the face of a, of a disaster is something I could relate to um back um in in the military hospitals that I've been in around sort of like that sort of like quite uh right like you know quite particular sense of humor when things are like really difficult and I, I saw that there so I think and and it was a it was a coping strategy, right? It was yeah, a coping absolutely. strategy. It's um, something that my granddad always used to say, and like my dad said, still says it now. He's like, if you don't laugh, you'll cry. And there's this like thing mm. which is like, you know, we are in this thing, and it's not going to change anytime soon. Like you know, it's not like oh, everyone's going to be their lives going to be back to normal or back to some kind of normal nets in like a couple of days so it's almost like okay what do we have <laughs> you know and often that is humor when you look yeah. at history um when you look at when something really awful was happening you would kind of <clears throat> see like films come out about like heroes and it's all about this like next level kind of hope and I kind of guess what we do now in society a lot is we just share hilarious memes or things like that right because yeah. that's the the thing that is allowing you yeah. to, to almost like um, check in with a different part of your reality. And I think it's really important. So even you saying like these kind of signs coming up and it being like a beach resort, um, there's something really like, yeah, human about that, that I'm just like, I get it. <laughs> you know, I, I totally feel that. And there were just moments where, you know, we do have to find ways to escape from the harsh and dark realities of what we're going through. And mm. sometimes humor just does that in a way where you're like, oh, okay, this is fine. You know, that meme where like the dog's literally like in the kitchen drinking like coffee and there's like fire behind him. It's like, this is fine. It's like that moment, right? Because how else do you keep going sometimes? Like what is the thing that's gonna keep pushing you um, forward? It's very interesting. Um, well, the, t the tourist board at the time had started this um, campaign to get more people to visit the Philippines and they had this tagline in the airport and they kept saying, more fun in the Philippines, uh, over and over on the, like, the mm -hmm. screens and everything. And um, after taking these photographs, um, the word taken is interesting, isn't it? After I, yeah, taking these photographs. Mm -hmm. um, I went for a walk around the city again and there was like a, a big line of people who were getting uh, rice, bags of rice. And I started, because a lot of people in Tacloban spoke English. Mm -hmm. So I started chatting to a group of people and, um, and, and I think talking to people is really interesting because like, you know, the, the journalist, um, Steve was like, can we get a picture of this line of people like hungry, looking for rice? And I'm like, oh, here we go again. <laughs> mm -hmm. Like, and it was that was a reality. But like, what were we? What were we saying there? Like, what? Why? You know? Yes, it's it's good. It's good to document like the the things that tell us that this is an abnormal situation that people are now to get food. But like, nobody here looks like sad. Mm. And and as I was walking down the line, there's like, don't don't forget, more fun in the Philippines. And they started <laughs> laughing. So I've got this photo of like everyone laughing instead because there's like the reality of them waiting in a queue and then there's like these young lads like joshing around saying more fun in the Philippines. Yeah. So it was just, it's nice to get a range of things rather than just like the one thing yeah, that people cool. expect to see. And even like this image here, like literally <laughs> three people just like sat down at a table, like, you know, all these kind of like, I think you can look at this image and be like, oh my gosh, it's like a mess. But then when you look at it, you're like, it's not though. It's actually, there's so much like organized living happening. And just the way that like, you know, you've just got this like beaming smile. There's just something 
so like I don't know I don't look at this image and feel bad for people I mean I feel bad for the fact that this devastating thing has happened like that's awful and that's tragic but I don't look at this image and think that I don't know I, I, and there's also something about being born in like Britain right that can make you look at anywhere that isn't here or anywhere that isn't you know like a hugely rich country or whatever that mm. can make you look at other people and be like oh I could I'm glad I'm not you or whatever and we have mm. to be honest that people do mm -hmm. have that opinion right and looking at this image it's just like pure like resilience to me it's just this image of people just like together right doing what they need to do well they um, made a little shot so I was with that family before I took this photo and then I was like can I get a picture of you and they were like yeah so I, I went out and I was like I'll show you and I said I'm going to show a bit like of the damage if that's okay and they were like yeah and then uh, as I was taking uh, she had her like back to me with an umbrella and then and then she turned around and started like laughing <laughs> and she just thought it was really funny that I was taking pictures of her selling like peanuts with her sons yeah there's um, just something like about it though and I'm like <laughs> and it feels like and I know I keep like bringing this up it feels like the human the human story and um, before we go into the next thing I'm just aware of the time um obviously we started a little bit late um, so if everyone is okay with me just kind of carrying on a little bit, um, we will finish at 3.30 instead, if that's okay with you, Ali. Yeah. Okay, amazing. I don't even know what time it is now. I don't know what day it is. <laughs> it is Saturday, the 13th of February. And uh, oh. 15.18. Um, so I just kind of want to go through a little bit um, just a few more of these images um maybe actually one more image the next one sure. um or two after this one maybe um and i'd like to kind of uh, go into the part of the conversation where um we talk a little bit about safety and what you're kind of doing now because there's something that's really interesting to me about like the parallels that uh, kind of like connect up almost, even though parallels are not ever meant to connect up in lots of ways, but there, there <laughs> is some diagonal connect up lines. Um, so for me, there's like, I'll cl slowly click through them and then speak about the one that I really want to kind of touch on. Um, there's something about this image for me, <laughs> that is this collective, <laughs> um saving of objects right and then these objects are like and it's always something about toys that yeah. is like, toys have got to be saved they've got to be like salvaged and like looked after and there was just something really beautiful about that um for me because there's obviously lots of like families right um and I remember you speaking about um when you saw people kind of like wading through like whatever it was some water some like wreckage to like get these objects back um and it's really interesting because for me the the way that we look at objects or that we look at our belongings it doesn't just it never stops if that makes sense there's always something even if you're like a minimalist right there's still something that has this value to you that it kind of can't be replaced like yes we have the memories of these, of these things but to have a physical object um and I do find that it often is around like young kids and their toys and there was just something really nice about this just like they're just drying out okay <laughs> like they're, they're pegged out and they they're like part of the story as much as everyone else is if that makes sense yeah, I mean, this. I, there's like a whole series of these um, called These Precious Things. And uh, I've never, never shared all of the that piece, but I, I just decided one day that I was going to um, speak to people about what, what they tried to say, what, what was like really important to mm -hmm. them. And, you know, um, so there was like, right, someone had got all their books and they were putting them out in the sun to dry. And I just loved the teddies because they'd like, they pegged like each ear, like they weren't just 
thrown on the line. It was like, they've, they're all put up like really carefully. And um, when I, th this image, when I went into the church, um, the way that people have created like their little personal spaces uh, with their objects was just, mm -hmm. I just loved it. I mean, this one's got like a little Eiffel Tower and it had like, um, like the religious iconography because, you know, largely most people in um, Tacloban were Catholic, mm -hmm. but also like the little pen holder in the pot and the little frog. And, the, and it's just like these little things from their houses that they found that still had left that was really part of their identity because, and, and I'm related to it because, you know, we, we all have these like objects in, in life that have like this sentimental value and this sort of attachment. Um, it's just hard to uh, untangle ourselves from. Like, I know that most people are trying to be like the Buddha and be like fully free of all attachments, but I, I don't know, not <laughs> Uh, when I go to, well, when I did go to places like this in the past, I was really always kind of loved how pe what people related to, what what was like part of them, how did they express themselves? So, yeah. Amazing. Thank you so much, Ali, for just speaking about some of those um, those images. They just like when you sent them to me, I was kind of like, I know I messaged you back just like, oh my gosh, like, you know, because there's something about, um, yeah, just that, the narrative around it and hearing those small kind of like little stories, um, they like make the, the image feel like it, it's not just like static anymore. It almost feels like it's like layering, um, <laughs> On itself it's really um yeah it's really striking when that starts to happen as well um mm. so there's a couple of things that um i want to kind of go on to and we have um got a question as well so um i will move on to that too i wanted to speak about um raw and so i'll make this comment a statement before um but how I kind of have seen how your like practice has kind of changed and developed. There's this really interesting way that, um, yeah, as you look at things or see things, you're able to kind of build um, projects, activities that almost like give space to something to like to live, right? To, and I don't use the word rectify because it's not that, but mm. it's, space to to move and, and develop and almost I guess mobilize in lots of ways um so what I want to touch on is firstly what raw is um secondly what the um next gen of safety trainers looks like and what that is and what are you kind of working on there um and then I will go into um the the Q&A section yeah. So um, for a few years, um, from about 2014, um, I, I went, uh, supported a lot of uh, freelance photographers and journalists and um, helped to run a hostile environment and first aid courses. Um, it was part of my work as well. Like I actually, I really enjoyed doing it as a, as a trainer and um, but what I what I noticed um, was that um, there was this this like very intense sort of like four or five day course which covered kind of like the very, most extreme things about whatever people consider a hostile environment or this has been shaped to be what people thought was a hostile environment and mm -hmm. um, some of the training that came out of that and some of the space uh, spaces that were made were were only relevant to uh, to a certain demographic of people. And um, when I moved to Birmingham, I became like more conscious of the fact that a lot of the stuff that we delivered on HEFAC courses were really relevant to like all of us. Mm. And especially people who uh, feel underrepresented, underrepresented, but also most in fear of being threatened and attacked and abused. And um, I kind of then just blended like stuff that I'd taken from like the HEFAT environment and set up RAW to do that for like everybody, but for women and non-binary people in, in the West Midlands mm -hmm. um, and just tried it out. Um, and I think 
I've always had like a strong sense of when I see things and read things and a bit of a tangent, but I went to this blue stockings bookshop in New York and it's the first time I've been to like a, um, a bookshop, which was like really centered on like books by women, books by trans women, books by queer people, um, books for like kids that weren't about white kids. And I was like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Like, and as soon as you start seeing things, you can't like unsee it. Yeah. And, and if you have like a strong sense of like maybe justice or being part of something to change things, I, I, I kind of raw came from like those collective experiences as well as reflecting on the past of being in institutions where I've gained loads of interesting stuff, but also created lots of harm. So raw sort of is, is a safety collective. It's made of like lots of different people who are interested in that and um, including yourself. Mm -hmm. And um, it's not like uh it, its main function or if it, if it was to have a main one is to really like change the landscape of who gets to feel safe in their own skin like who has the tools to access to be able to train to be able to like be a part of that to be able to go on like courses like what what does that really mean and how can we do it in a in a world that is so um unsafe in so many different ways at the moment um and so we've because I have that relationship with journalism, um, an organization, a charity in America have uh, asked us for like the next year to run a program to make space for the next generation of safety trainers uh, um, who will be women or non-binary people who are based in America, who we will give, a, give the platforms to learn all the things so they can be newsroom safety advisors mm -hmm. and run their own hostile environment training in a way that represents the real threat um, to, to journalists in America at the moment. So it's, it's, it's very like looking over the way from here, but it, it, it all overlaps. Like the things we'll do in the States will relate to what we do here in the UK in many ways. We're all part of that same problem. Um, and I that's that's kind of what I've been working on and does it relate to photography a bit I guess it relates to experiences mm -hmm. um it I listen I guess I've listened a lot and I'm excited by the cohort that's going to apply we've already got a really interesting group of people who are going to come through on this and and like it may not change things imminently mm -hmm. but over a decade it will start to change that landscape um, and you know, I'm here to like just be a bit of a space holder, really. Absolutely. Um, it's really interesting that you kind of mention um, when you said photography. Does it link to photography a little bit? I feel like there's this, um, there's probably <laughs> a, a moment or like a, a part of the journey that like has allowed you to create the the space for stories to come through and through doing that like via photography that and I'm saying this from the perspective of being like involved with raw and I think there's something about knowing and experiencing lots of different people's stories allows you to then want to make more space for those stories and there's something about raw and the next gen of safety trainers that really comes out of that. Um, and I think it's really, yeah, it's really great. And that's not just because I have involvement, but it is really great in terms of people like myself, people that identify as being non-binary or people that are gender queer or gender fluid, or, you know, not living in a, the, the binaries of gender, actually feeling that there is space to become a safety trainer and know how to, um, and know the safety that your community needs um, and not kind mm. of be seeing that through one lens of safety. Um, so just to kind of um, finish up, we have a question. Oh, also, you. just before we, there is like a free survival guide that we're making in Birmingham and the Black Country that will come out in, I think, May with Multistory. Okay. So that stuff we've talked about, there will be actually like some free resource for that soon. Okay, thank you so much. Um, so this is from Camilla. 
Um, it says, hi, Ali, hope you're well, smiley face. Um, you've talked about trying to make deeper connections to people before you photograph them and how that can create a more collaborative representation. I wonder if you think about representation connected with your activism. What do you feel more comfortable um, representing nowadays? Oh, that's a really good question. Yeah. It's well, um, I think I'm more comfortable connecting with um, areas where I have similar lived experience. Mm. So I still very much want to uh, carry on and do more work around the subjects of whiteness and the subject of whiteness within the military and how that's a that affects people's relationship with the military and also how um, how the military recruits. Like mm -hmm. I came from a sort of working class, a white working class background and from a you know particular family history. So I I can I can speak to that. I can certainly listen to people talk about that and and I can I, I think that's where I feel most credible in some areas because um, you know, sometimes the conversation you have with someone who used to be in the military is quite harmful and they can have some very particular views. So um, I think I'm sort of in the, in the right space to be able to do that. And mm -hmm. I'm still looking at the kind of aftermath of that military life, especially from the perspective of being, um, being a woman and, you know, the consequences of being in that environment um, from all angles, not just one. So um, I think if I was still to do photography, it would be along those lines. But I think um, nowadays I feel more like an artist that spans lots of different areas. And like, mm -hmm. I even feel like raw is part of the art. It's not just a, a thing. It's like part of that. And that's, that's really my activism now. Um, so, and, and it's a good question. And I think it changes, you know, it's not like I'm set on one thing, but um I certainly wouldn't feel comfortable in, in covering stories where I don't have a really deep understanding or a connection to the person that I'm with. Mm. Um, but I certainly like to collaborate with other photographers and artists on the same subject because that's interesting to get like multiple perspectives on one story as well. Um, yeah. Thank you so much, Ali. Uh, that was a really, really great question. Um, Kamala, I really appreciate that because every something about what we touched on of what does it mean when you like, what does it mean when you are acknowledging your journey, right? And what that mm. looks like and where that can bring you or take you, bring, can bring you from or take you to. Um, yeah. It's really interesting. So I really thank you for um, that question. Um, thank you everyone who's still here. Uh, I really appreciate you all um, and everyone who is um, listening from YouTube, listening or watching, either one. Um, we really appreciate you. Ali, thank you so much for just like bringing like all of these stories. It's been really beautiful to, to connect with you in this way as well. Um, it's been really great to kind of see those images. Um, so I just want to kind of leave everyone with um, a little bit of information about uh, our next kind of talk. Um, and it's going to be with Rico Johnson Sinclair. Um, Rico is amazing. Um, he actually created a um, independent kind of film night that happened in Birmingham called CineQ. Um, and we'll be speaking kind of about what that means to bring certain stories um, into uh, a kind of independent kind of setting um, and what that means in the context of Birmingham, what that means in the context of the BFI um, and all of those kind of areas of um, film. So yeah, really looking forward to it. Um, I'm going to put the holding screen on so you can see the date and time. It is the 27th of February, 2 p.m. till 3.15. Um, and again, you can uh, watch through the stream, which will be on our website and on YouTube. Um, so with that, I will leave you um, with this holding screen. Um, and I just want to say 
like really like thank you for everyone um, coming and um, we really appreciate uh, just having this time to convene with each other. So yes, thank you so much um, and have a lovely weekend and take a moment to jot down date and time um, <laughs> that you uh, need for next week. So I hope to see you all soon on the settee. Goodbye.